18th, February 2024, John Hammond coming to you from a very rainy Norwich, UK. Sunday morning, and um, the Lord's called me to go to the usual place of uh, obedience. Um, yes, it's a, a church building of a certain type of denomination, but yesterday we had a brilliant men's breakfast meeting nothing elaborate just coffee and snacks a video a talk and discussion around tables getting to the nitty-gritty of what worship is and we looked at Martha Mary and Lazarus the second occasion after Lazarus was resurrected from the dead a few days before Jesus was to be crucified and we looked at that three different types of worship three different types of people so today the thought for today a very quick thought I'm driving into the city now so I'm fully concentrating on the journey procrastination I was saying to my wife just now procrastination even when I was in business and not a Christian, not a disciple, not born again, uh, a believer in God's existence, but not a follower of Jesus. When I was in business, we had the term procrastination is the thief of time. And of course, it's true. It's what it's called a worldly truism. A truism is a, a truth. And procrastination, as a thief of time, procrastination means you put off doing something. And then the time goes. And you may not feel, feel emotionally, you may not feel like doing it. So procrastination. The world calls it procrastination the thief of time. But of course we know who the thief is. We know the thief, the robber, he comes to steal, rob, thieve. That is the spirit of the enemy. And we know what Jesus said about the God of this age. The God of this fallen age is the devil himself, the ruler the one who's taken power over people's lives in every form of religion that you can think of, every form of business that you can think of, every type of way of life. Above it all is the God of this age, the devil, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the God of this age. And, and one of the uh, definitions of the devil is that he's a thief he comes to kill steal and destroy and and that is the nature of the devil a killer a thief a destroyer now if you were like me before you were born again you were in business the the world of business is all about the competition in the sense of putting them out of business. It's all about fighting, fighting people to win their clients to yourself. Now, if you bring that spirit of competition into Christianity, although most church leaders would deny it, there is this sense that their church is better than anybody else's church and the proactive ones who are switched on to the marketing methods they will reach out to bring more staff on board to their vision of their local church and this is this is the subtle deception that has happened over christianity progressively for the last 30 years where business methods, marketing, management, all the things that m enable the world's organizations to be successful, the church has taken them on board 
even appointing official sales, marketing and PR consultants, maybe not even Christians who are in consultancy, but just using the methods of this world to enable church leaders to have an effective organization in terms of communication, internal communication, just like the world has internal communication. So what I'm saying is, by now, if you haven't understood, there is very, very little difference between worldly companies and religious companies, worldly charities and religious charities. And I'm using the word religious as opposed to Christian charities. So religious charities, like the Red Crescent, is a, a, a religious version of the Red Cross. Because certain countries didn't want the Red Cross coming in because of the Christian connotations of the Red Cross. Even though that was reflecting on the Swiss flag, um, which is, uh, I, th I believe it's the white cross on a red background, but the red cross is a red cross on a white background, but the connotations of the cross is Jesus Christ. And the stigma there is the Crusades, where they went into the Middle East to kill the infidels. But coming back to the point of charities, so Christian charity, Christian love, Faith, hope and charity. The greatest is charity, love. And God is love. So certain Christians, believing it's right, start a charity in the name of Jesus. And then they do the good works in the name of Jesus. And very soon they realize that you cannot scale up the Christian charity that you have in your heart to do good to bring Christ's love to people, you start to understand you need to scale it up because money, you have a bank account, and with the bank account you need a treasurer. So you're trying to be like Christ and be good to people and help them, and money can come to you. And your heart might be right not to look for the money, but the money comes to you. But you don't want to look after the money. You just want to help people. You want to love them. You want to care for them. You want to pray for them. But what are you going to do with the money? So you either look for a treasurer or someone makes themselves known to look after the money for you. And that is classically how churches are, are started. One man, two men, three men women, couple of couples get together and they think and or feel, let's start a church for God. Let's start a new church and we'll call it such and such. We'll have a bank account. We'll have joint signatories. It'll all be above board. And oh yes, we need a legal uh, charter, charity uh, registration with a charity commission. We need to follow the rules and regulations and we get tax relief. And suddenly, it becomes a business, registered business, with a remit. But I know what I'm talking about is not, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize the life of Christ. Jesus' life was very spiritual. He was fully in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, fully human, fully God, his life is the example for us to live by not just because uh, we're born again uh, disciples who become apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists because we're something in the kingdom of heaven when you understand that the kingdom of heaven is not of this world you start to realize what jesus said was absolutely true of course jesus only spoke the truth in love you must hate your life in this world. How else can you inherit the kingdom of heaven? How else can you et inherit eternal life? If you love the things of this world, if you love your life in this world, if you love your job, your position, 
that your CEO or managing director or chief priest or archbishop or a canon or you're a canon and the canons in the city uh, acknowledge you as, a, as, as being of high caliber like they are and they make you a canon but you're part of the free church and what has the Anglican system got to do with you? Well, you know, going to the very top of the top denomination, the original founding denomination of the, the so-called church model for doing church, the Catholics, the Pope, the top Pope over all the bishops and archbishops, that he has sort of invented himself as the supreme vicar of Christ over all shaking hands with every archbishop of every denomination, shaking hands with every head of state, government, officials, and of course other religions. This move towards multi-faithism is such an evil. Apart from the fact it's an ism, multi-faithism, that smacks of the Freemasons where they compile all the so-called gods into a compilation god, giving that compilation god a name, a secret name only known to the Freemasons. Well, it's all out there on the internet now. So this idea of uniting with other faiths, different religions, believing there is only one god, and that God is over all the faiths. Well, that's not true. It's a lie. And when you understand that the Jehovah Witnesses are, are being living under a lie of deception for generations, 100 years or more, and the Mormons equally living under a lie of a false Christ, a vision from a false angel to a false shepherd, Joseph Smith, when you understand that these are generations of people who've been living under a lie, under a deception, under blindness, spiritual blindness, and auditory blindness. They can't hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. They can't see what God is doing. They can't see what Jesus said is true. They don't understand. So this morning, I have to put off that spirit of procrastination. I have to put off the thing of putting off. Put this off, put this off, delay, delay, delay. And that demon, I'll call it out as a demon, an entity, a spirit, is an entity, a person. Because Lucifer is a person, every fallen angel is a person, every demon is a person. And you can treat these uh, demonic thoughts that come to you as a person to cast out of your mind your heart your emotional heart your feelings you can cast these things out as you would cast a physical person out of your house if they came to steal kill and destroy i'm talking spiritually i'm talking figuratively but there is a point where we understand the physical realm points to the spiritual realm and all the parables that jesus told about the the trees the fig tree no fruit all show that speaks of a lot of worldly denominations where the local church has put on shows theater religious theater comedy shows having a laugh and a joke about this that and the other and all of this is what churchianity is. Churchianity is for churchians. You might say Christianity is for Christians. What about disciples? What about the Holy Spirit? What about Jesus himself? We follow Jesus, not a religion. We, we absolutely do believe in the Bible. The Holy Spirit breathed Bible the inerrant, infallible word of Scripture. But Jesus is the living word. And only when you give your life to Jesus, only when you're born again, do you understand from the Holy Spirit point of view 
what it's all about. And of course, every new baby craves spiritual milk. And this is why uh, going to church is a better thing than not going to church. Because the Sunday school in proper evangelical Christian churches, not Jehovah's Witnesses, not the Mormons, obviously, not the cults, but ordinary Christians talking about the simple stories of Jesus and the, and the stories speak for themselves and the Bible speaks for, the, for itself and the Holy Spirit comes upon the children to show them the truth of these wonderful stories. Children's Bibles full of pictures illustrating the life of Christ. The seeds of truth being sown into the minds and hearts of the children. Spiritual truths for the children in proper evangelical Christian Sunday schools. Of course, the parents, Christian parents, you're meant to read these stories to the children every bedtime. You're meant to feed your children spiritually as well as physically. Clothe them spiritually as well as physically. The spiritual armour of God. It's, not, it's never too early to tell your children about the spiritual armour of God. To protect them, their minds, from teachers who don't believe in Jesus Christ, not the Jesus we know. They don't believe in the Lamb of God who shed his blood. They won't even mention that in context in a school setting. Recently I've heard of a child at school before the high school, so we're talking about the middle school in the UK, where the teacher was an atheist and said something to the child and the child said something and the teacher said, well are you a Christian? Yes. And the teacher came against that child's belief in Christ in a, in a school setting, preaching about atheism which is his religion, undermining the faith of a child, the enemy using the atheist to try to rob the child of simple faith in Jesus Christ. And the child resisted and told mummy and daddy. And when I saw them, the child told me as well. And we explained atheism is a false religion, it denies the existence of God, denies Jesus. And of course, we know the enemy has blinded the minds of the atheists that they believe 100% they're right and that 100% we're wrong and we cannot argue with atheists. Blind guides. The whole world is full of blind guides who are blind to the fact that Jesus Christ exists. And they're deaf guides as well because they can't hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And that word is to the Christian churches listed in Revelation, but throughout the New Testament. But of course that applies to every single citizen alive today on earth. Have you got an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying? And many would say, I don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. But would you like to receive the Holy Spirit now? Faith like a mustard seed. Open your hand, receive the truth. And when you put the mustard seed in their hand, often they close their hand and some have put it straight into their heart by faith. And some you put it, uh, the, a imaginary mustard seed, I drop it in your hand, there are drops of mustard seed in your hand. They close up and I said, what are you gonna do with that? They put it in their heart. What are you going to do with that? I don't know. Put it in your heart. The seed of faith. There is a God who loves you. You've received a, a mustard seed of truth. There is a God who loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And one man said recently, an alcoholic man who came to uh, the, the clipper here, the, the cab of this van, he came. And I said, Jesus, 
God sent his only begotten son to die for you. And he was in tears. Why did he die for me? Because he loves you. He loves you. Jesus has a plan for you, I said to him. I'm going to hopefully meet him in this building now. I, I met him yesterday. Again, he came to the van. I reminded him. Go to this building on Sunday morning and ask for Jesus' help. Just say to who, whoever they speaks to you, I've come for Jesus' help. And I hope and pray he's there. I'm going to go into the building now to see if he's there. And that is my purpose of being there. Obedience to God's call to be there. To be there for him. And there'll be others too. To feed the sheep. Lost sheep and found sheep if they'll come to the shepherd. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. We can feed them with what we've learned along the way. This is nearly my 40th year in Christ. I spent more time in Christ now than I have before I knew Jesus. If you're not born again, read John 3, 3 to 17 and 21, and resolve today to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be number one. I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I, I've done wrong things all my life. And I want to stop. I want to change. I need forgiveness. I need faith. I need to see I can change. Lord, I repent of all my sins. Lord, forgive me. Father, forgive me. I thank you for the only begotten Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for me in my place to pay the price for me and my sins. I receive the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Jesus, that you've forgiven me. I'm determined to go and sin no more, Lord, and I need your help. I need you to show me what's beneath the surface of the, of the life of people around me. Do they come in peace? Are they open to receive the Holy Spirit? Will they receive prophecy? Will they hu humble themselves to your spirit, Lord, so that we can encourage them in the faith? one day of salvation at a time. New wineskins are receiving new wine. So God bless you where you are in the Holy Spirit. Obey Christ. Obey God the Father. In Christ, in the Holy Spirit. That is your worship, obedience to God. Pray for us as we're praying for you. God bless you. Talk soon, I hope. God bless.